Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us early on a Monday, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies for today's panel discussion, an assessment of Russian defense capabilities and security strategy. I'm Sam Brannan, a senior fellow with the CSIS International Security Program, and I'm privileged to be joined uh, with you uh, today to hear the thoughts of my CSIS colleagues and deep subject matter experts on this topic, Dr. Andy Cutchins, Dr. Clark Murdoch, uh, Dr. Paul Schwartz, sorry, before Clark Murdoch, and Dr. Jeff Mankoff. You can consider today's panel a behind-the-scenes look at how a think tank works. Today's public event is the more formal continuation of a series of conversations that we've had over recent months as we sought to figure out in elevators and hallways and on the sidewalk uh, to make sense of what exactly happened in late February and early March of this year in Crimea and what's happening in Moscow. Today's event is really thanks also to Oliver Bacchus, the research assistant in the Russia and Eurasia program who pulled everything together for today. Uh, in the checkout line at the National Geographic cafeteria just around the corner, I was complaining to uh, Oliver about Tom Friedman's op-ed that argued that Putin had blinked in the Ukraine crisis and that the United States had successfully stared him down. And I won't go into the uh, points raised about the historical accuracy of the Dean Rusk statement uh, by Glenn Kessler in yesterday's Washington Post, but suffice it to say that I told Oliver that I was concerned and he agreed that even before the crisis that we now face in Iraq, Washington again risked downplaying the potential threat posed by Russian President Vladimir Putin and Russia's military and intelligence capabilities. Oliver suggested that we do an event to bring the threat of Russian capabilities and intent into proper focus, and here we are thanks to the time and generosity of, of intellect from Clark and Andy, who had served on a previous event we did looking at just the Ukraine crisis before Friedman's comment, and also thanks to Jeff and Paul, who have done some very interesting re recent writing on this topic. So to get Andy to agree to do this event, I had to promise I would keep my introductory remarks much shorter than last time, <laughs> and I'm already running dangerously close to breaking that promise. So let me briefly frame what we will cover today and then try to turn it over quickly to you for questions and, and discussion with this remarkably expert audience. There are two extreme viewpoints floating around town. First, that Russia has reemerged as the preeminent threat to global security and stability, and something the opposite of that, that Russia is dangerous from its weakness, but that weakness will continue to eat away at its military capabilities, and thus we must only manage Russia's decline as the sick man of Eurasia. So as we contemplate China's rise, a Middle East in full-blown crisis, and a U.S. population that is increasingly uneasy with any sort of activist foreign policy, how should we properly consider Russian capability and intent? The reason for this event, as I mentioned, is to keep focus on the important question of how concerned U.S. defense and security planners and strategists should be about Russian defense capabilities and intent. So let me introduce Dr. Andy Cutchins, who will open the conversation this morning by answering the question, what were they thinking in the Kremlin in February and March of this year? What are they thinking now? And who exactly is making the decisions? <laughs> Dr. Cutchins is a senior fellow and director of the CSIS Russia and Eurasia program. He is an internationally known expert on Russian foreign and domestic policies who publishes widely and is frequently called upon by business, government, media, and academic leaders for comment and consulting on Russian and Eurasian affairs. His more recent scholarship has de been devoted to issues including Russia's Asia strategy with significant travel throughout Central Asia, the role of energy in the Russian Far East, and a continued laser-like focus on Russia's fast-shifting foreign policy. Let's call it Novo Russia nationalism. Over to you, Andy, to get us started. Thanks very much, Sam, for uh, both uh, together with Oliver uh, putting together this panel and this meeting, um, and for those generous uh, introductory remarks. I like to joke with people working, like a think working at a think tank, what does that mean? Well, it means I'm working 24-7. <laughs> I'm thinking when I'm in the shower. I'm thinking when I'm on the golf course. I'm thinking while I'm watching FIFA World Cup soccer. And, uh, but it really is, to be a little bit more seriously, exactly as, as Sam said, it is those uh, uh, unplanned conversations that take place, sort of the, the cross-fertility amongst us that uh, I think uh, brings us to some of our uh, 
uh, best, best results. And I think uh, these series of two uh, meetings are, are part of that. Um, also on the introduction, well, I would venture to say we know who makes the decisions in Moscow. Uh, why he does, however, I think remains a very difficult question to fully answer. Um, what I'm going to do briefly in my uh, 10 minutes is kind of go through what the Russians say doctrinally about uh, <clears throat> how they see the world, both in national security and foreign policy, and, um, and leave it uh, uh, particularly to Paul and to Clark to talk more about the, the capabilities, although there's one certain set of capabilities I'll talk a bit more since they don't uh, hit upon directly uh, conventional weaponry and uh, or nuclear weapons. So point one for Russia is that uh, its nuclear deterrent is at the heart of its security strategy. Um, the first great achievement, greatest achievement of the Soviet Union uh, was the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. The second most uh, greatest achievement was achieving nuclear parity with the United States in the early 1970s. And it is this achievement that is the most important legacy uh, from the standpoint of military security, clearly, that was bequeathed to uh, the Russian Federation. And it's assumed greater significance in the wake of conventional deterioration over the last 20 plus years. And doctrinally, the bar has been lowered on conditions justifying uh, a nuclear strike the use of nuclear weapons. There's some controversy about this, but uh, I think the, the taboo on no first use uh, is no longer such a, such a taboo. Now, maintaining strategic stability, i.e. parity, uh, or more to the point, preventing the United States, and anybody else for that matter, from having a first strike capability is really at the crux, at the core. This is absolutely essential. Um, and it, it sounds kind of obvious, but sometimes we forget the obvious at our peril. And it was very striking to me, uh, I think Jeff was at this meeting of the Valdai Discussion Club in Moscow in 2011, where when I made a comment to Putin about what a couple of U.S. senators had supposedly told Mr. Rogozin, according to Mr. Rogozin's account, was, <clears throat> well, actually, the term I did use there was bullshit. I did that to kind of provoke Vladimir a little bit. I was successful. And uh, uh, he, first of all, kind of looked across the table and peered at me. Andrew, your name's Andrew, right? Yes. I don't know if you really want Mr. Putin to know who you are. <laughs> it's a very dubious distinction, perhaps. But what his, his response was, and he went into a sort of a long history, essentially, of how um, through espionage efforts uh, during and after World War I, it was scientists uh, who believed that strategic stability was of absolute importance and their role in conveying uh, uh, technical information about the development of nuclear weapons capability, which was essential for the Soviet Union to achieve its nuclear weapons capability, uh, was of utmost importance because this prevented one country from having a monopoly on nuclear weapons. And What's the relationship, of course, to missile defense, the concern that missile defense, combined with other things, may compromise uh, that um, strategic stability and that one country may have a first strike capability. Uh, he said it in a lengthy way. He said it in a rather emotional way, too, I would say. Um, the last point on this point, I think, is the Russian position on nonproliferation which for the most part, you know, I think from the non standpoint of the nonproliferation community, has been pretty constructive. Now, there is a, uh, a one, certainly one good reason, aside from supporting the nonproliferation regime, uh, 
Uh, and it is certainly that the more countries that develop a nuclear capability, that would devalue uh, some of the strategic advantage that Russia would have with its um, key trump card of nuclear weapons. And it's important maybe for us to think about the Budapest Memorandum signed 20 years ago in which Ukraine, uh, Belarus, and Kazakhstan made the decision to give up their nuclear weapons. We had an interesting discussion last uh, Thursday evening here at CSIS when the uh, former Russian foreign minister, first Russian foreign minister of an independent Russia, Andrei Kozarev, was with us about whether or not, uh, for example, U Ukraine might have had the opportunity to keep those, wep keep those weapons and what obviously that would have meant. Um, the, uh, uh, for the Russians, like any other, I think, nuclear weapon state or aspiring nuclear weapon state, the idea of global zero to them uh, is, uh, this is probably a little bit provocative, is sort of nonsense because this would simply make the world safe for American conventional weapons domination. The second point, uh, I think, for the Russians is NATO expansion, the old bugaboo. And if you look at the, these uh, documents, and let me uh, give a shout out to Oliver Backus and Eric Griffith for the terrific analysis uh, they prepared for me in preparation for this event and looking at the uh, 2009 uh, national security document, the 2010 military, military security, and the most recent document that came out in 2013 from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. NATO expansion remains the, the greatest threat. And, uh, quote, attempts of certain countries or groups of countries to revise the universally recognized norms of international law. Um, one change of late uh, is that uh, Engagement with NATO is no longer a priority, as it was in the past. Uh, any attempt to, quote, build up relations with NATO takes into account the degree of its readiness for equitable partnership, strict adherence to the norms and principles of international law, real progress towards a common space of peace and security, da 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 um, The uh, several reasons for, for NATO. One, I mean, Russia has traditionally had a very keen focus on territory, I mean, going back centuries of territorial uh, security. I mean, particularly the great historians Richard Pipes, uh, Ed Keenan, who had rather different explanations for this. Mr. Pipes would sort of assert that it's basically in the Russian DNA to expand into territory, to uh, create so-called buffer zones. At one point recently, I was thinking, what would be an adequate buffer zone for Mr. Putin? probably the Atlantic Ocean. That would be a good buffer zone. Um, Keenan had a different explanation, which I'm more sympathetic to, uh, and that is that um, Russia basically, you know, over the centuries when it was expanding, behaved in a way that was normal for great powers, but in abnormal geography. In Russia moving east, it faced virtually certainly no physical uh, impediments to going all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And in the south, uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, it met relatively uh, weak uh, uh, resistance from Persia and uh, the Ottoman Empire. But this notion of a buffer zone is right at the core. And you know, we always heard this statement back in the 1990s, it drive me nuts, that NATO is expanding right up to our borders. Well, Norway was a founding member of, Na of NATO. Norway was always on the border of the, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, the question that is not often asked uh, is, what is driving those countries that seek to join NATO? Why? Um, and, uh, and it was certainly, it was, Russians are loath, at least uh, in written word, to talk about, they're more inclined to think that this was a plot, plot in Washington, to weaken Russia when, in fact, we were more responding to the demand from East Central European states for security relationships. Um, <clears throat> I think if we look at the, the key moments for the NATO relationship, uh, two stand out, one especially, Serbia 1999, when 
and the Russian narrative, NATO uh, 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 committed an illegal act that was not sanctioned by international law, i.e. the United Nations, uh, in undertaking that, that war. Now, in 2001, and af after in Afghanistan, Russia supported ISAF, which was principally a set of NATO countries, because it viewed these were, they had, we had common interests. And then the most recent, I think, uh, major violation from the standpoint of, of Russia was Libya in 2011. And I think they view making a serious mistake in abstaining on the UN Security Council, allowing for the creation of the no-fly zone in Libya, but then viewing that NATO uh, exceeded its mandate uh, there with that. Um, and this takes us to the third, the third point, and uh, I mean, I'm going to go over my time is a couple of minutes. I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> but since you went shorter on your introduction, <laughs> <laughs> and and that is a maintaining stability, or how you might, some might term it, Russian hegemony in the countries nearby, uh, or as uh, former President Dmitry Medvedev talked in. Uh, after the Georgia War in August of 2008 about Russia's zone of privileged interests. Um, now here, for the most part, the primary tool, at least on a multilateral basis for the Russians, has been the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Um, but interestingly, in the new um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs document, uh, they talk of, it's talked about as the Eurasian Economic Union is a priority while the CSTO remains relevant. That's a quote. Um, from a military security standpoint, probably the biggest development over the years in the CSTO has been uh, the development of a rapid reaction force, um, which initially was to be uh, in a base in Osh in Kyrgyzstan as a CSTO base, but there was a big debate about that. Uh, and it eventually ended up being a, a bilateral agreement between the Russian Federation and uh, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, the, uh, the, the fourth point uh, to make uh, about Russia's uh, kind of doctrinal, sort of the, the mental framework that I think drives uh, how these sorts of weapons that they're uh, developing uh, has to do with a very conservative interpretation of the priority of national sovereignty over the right to intervene. And this is a big one. Um, now, until quite recently, uh, the Russians had been very traditional defenders of Westphalian sovereignty. Uh, and it was a, a key reason why they opposed the independence of Kosovo. Now, but with the case of Crimea, Crimea basically, uh, the Russians, I think, are saying, well, okay, you did Kosovo, we're going to do Crimea. And there's a, sim a similar justification for doing, for doing so, whether you Americans like it or not. And I think also the, uh, uh, on the issue of right to intervene more broadly, um, I think that has become clearly less of a doctrinal taboo for the Russians. But one can look at what they've been doing in Ukraine uh, for the last few months, and one can, if you, you can see roots of this as to what uh, Russian forces were doing uh, and in Georgia, particularly in Abkhazia, back in 1992. It's not all that new. Now, the, uh, uh, what does this mean uh, weapons-wise? And I'm sure Paul will say more about this, but it means a focus on access denial weaponry, access denial, to raise the cost of U.S. NATO intervention virtually anywhere. That's useful for the Chinese, that's useful for the Syrians, that's useful for a number of other uh, clients. So this puts an emphasis on anti-air, anti-ship technologies, and uh, key for Russian arms sales. The big difference between Russian arms sales today <coughs> and the Soviet Union is that the, usually the Russians are actually getting paid, which was not necessarily the case in the Soviet Union. Now, the second piece of this is that uh, kind of this kind of conservative interpretation of, of national sovereignty is the issue of uh, repressing dissent at home, no color revolutions. And this has really jumped up uh, in the last year in speeches by Russian officials, including Foreign Minister Lavrov and others. Uh, and it's not only um, thinking about uh, 
uh, dissent at home, but it's also thinking about dissent in countries that Russia has serious interests in. And here we have a very, very deep toolkit. And, uh, and the Russians, and this is probably the biggest difference in these uh, security and foreign affairs documents, uh, in the, the most recent one, new features, soft power. Russians did not talk about soft power in 2000, not even in 2009, 2010. Um, and what does that include? It includes what you do with civil society. It includes, it includes what you do with media. You have to win the narrative. It includes what you do with intelligence uh, forces penetration. It includes probably what you do with cyber. It also probably includes increasing concern about what you do with finan financial power. Last uh, two thoughts, uh, one on China. Um, in these documents, generally, Russia is silent about China. Uh, we'll say something rather anodyne about China being an important uh, developing partner. But uh, this, is a, this is an area that needs to be watched closely. Uh, they, their strategic rears are secured. It's important for them, and I think particularly for Russia, and to create, multi, create mutual vulnerabilities, which helps to secure those rears so that uh, uh, I, China will not move uh, in the direction of Russia in a military, in a military way. On the R&D uh, question, it's access denial, but I wonder whether they're also thinking more about access from, moving from access denial to actually weapons that promote gaining access, which is a very different kind of prop proposition. Uh, we have a there's, a, there's still important R&D niches uh, with uh, the Russians. The Chinese have a lot of money. I think we have to watch this very closely. And there's also the danger um, that there may be some kind of strategic bargain, for example, that the Russians may move from their studied neutral position vis-a-vis -vis Chinese territorial disputes in the East in order that the Chinese may support the Russians to have more running room in areas that the Russians are more concerned about. Certainly, um, Putin effectively kind of opening uh, European security front again is a strategic benefit for, for Beijing. Um, last thought, uh, what would be I Vlad's ideal fantasy? Well, if for the Soviet Union it was getting, um, achieving nuclear parity, and this is really a fantasy, uh, but I think for him, it would be developing a first strike capability. Um, and that would be the ultimate, I think, achievement for Putin uh, in his role in Russian, in Russian history. And uh, uh, I think we just better, just better keep a close eye on that um, because, uh, and don't underestimate uh, where his ambitions may take him. Uh, sorry for uh, going way over my time. No, thank you very much, Andy. Great, great start. Um, let me introduce the next speaker, Mr. Paul Schwartz. Uh, Mr. Schwartz is a senior associate with the CSIS Russia and Eurasia program. He specializes in acquisition and use of information technology, telecommunications, and military and aerospace technology to solve problems of defense, national security, and industry. His research is focused on Russian and Eurasian security policy and the Russian military and defense sectors, with a special emphasis on Russian defense technology programs, defense industrial base, arms export programs, and the future development of Russia's military capabilities. Last week, Paul released another excellent article I will point you to, also available on the uh, CSIS website, enti entitled Sergei Shogu, uh, it, forgive my pronunciation, I will let Paul pronounce it correctly, Progress Report on Military Modernization. Paul will cover today his findings in that paper and uh, more broadly his thoughts regarding Russian military capabilities and their likely trajectory over coming years. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the kind introduction, Sam. Before delving into specifics, I thought it might be useful to first provide you with a little context. It's now been six years since Russia's relatively poor performance in the Georgia War showed just how badly its military had declined since the Cold War. Since then, Russia has embarked on a major program of military reform. During the initial phase of that reform, they focused primarily on making structural changes, for example, converting divisions to brigades, while restarting procurement with the expectation that modernization would follow. Since then, the reform process has zigged and zagged a bit. There's even been a few notable reversals, 
But in general, Russia has stayed the course, especially with respect to the most important elements of reform. And as a result, the Russian military is, is finally starting to show real signs of improvement. The stated objectives of Russian military re reform are to move away from the Soviet era mass mobilization military and replace it with a smaller, more mobile, permanent combat ready force capable of fighting local and regional wars in Russia's near abroad. Less openly stated are three additional objectives as well. To counter the emerging threat from U.S. ballistic missile defense technology, to enhance Russia's anti-access capabilities, and to develop a long-range precision strike force. To improve its capabilities, the Russians intend to increase the percent of modern weapons held by the Russian military from its current level of about 19 percent to 70 percent by 2020. But since this will take time, Russia is in the meanwhile significantly increasing the pace of training and military exercises, which has led to real improvements in combat readiness. As part of the reform effort, the Russian military has been reorganized into four military districts, each a potential theater of operations with the east facing China, Central and Central Asia, the south facing the Caucasus, and the west facing NATO. Recently, Russia has also begun fortifying the Arctic. The Army currently comprises 79 brigades plus four elite airborne divisions, which are not technically part of the Army. As part of the reform process, the Russian Army is adopting net-centric warfare theories of modern warfare, and they're showing an increasingly sophisticated understanding of the concepts, but they continue to struggle to develop the necessary command and control systems. Um, one of the elements of reform is to develop the ideal and optimized brigade structure, they continue to experiment with this, having now moved from the initial experiment of a heavy brigade to a heavy, medium, and light structure, which allows uh, for better tailoring to meet the needs of each specific military district. A lighter brigade structure also contributes to achieving greater mobility, which is crucial for Russia because they still have to defend a country with nine time zones using a substantially reduced military force. To beef up its aging inventory of Soviet-era tanks, the Russians are buying new equipment, including up to 2,300 next-generation tanks, such as the Armada. But because serial production of these won't start until at least next year, achieving this by their goal deadline of 2020 seems increasingly unlikely. The Army is also buying over 1,000 new helicopters, 250 of which have already been delivered, plus 100 batteries of their precision Iskander ballistic missiles. The Navy is still divided into its four traditional fleets, the Northern, the Baltic, Black Sea, and Pacific, and there's also a Caspian Sea flotilla. Each fleet now reports to the specific military districts, which is important because it shows that the role of the Navy has been once again subordinated to primarily supporting land-based military operations. Currently, the Navy has too many models. For example, there's four different classes of destroyers, making it very difficult to maintain and resupply. To address this, the, the Navy is rolling out modular designs and attempting to standardize on a few core model, uh, models going forward. And while it rebuilds its tattered shipbuilding industry, the Russians are starting small, replacing lighter combat vessels to acquire experience before it tackles larger projects sometime later this decade. The Navy currently has just under 300 total combat vessels but it plans to purchase 24 new submarines and 50 surface warships by 2020. Interestingly, despite much talk of a new blue water Russian Navy, prior to 2020, the Russians will actually receive only a handful of ocean going vessels, 15 frigates, a few submarines, and two Mistral assault ships purchased from France, although it may also refit three Soviet era cruisers. The Air Force is starting from a relatively low baseline, having received, uh, received only a handful of aircraft prior to 2008. Fortunately for it, the Russian aircraft industry is in relatively good condition, having benefited greatly from ongoing export activity during this period. The Russians currently have 1,300 total combat aircraft, but expect to purchase 600 additional aircraft by 2020, although this is likely to slip somewhat. Most of these are, are fourth generation models, such as the Su-34, which is Russia's new multi-role deep strike fighter. However, Russia's 
first fifth generation stealth aircraft, the T-50, will not be ready until at least 2017. Meanwhile, the Russian Mil uh, Air Force is also receiving a lot of new precision strike weapons, such as the KH-101 cruise missile, which has an effective range of up to 5,000 kilometers. But the Russian Air Force continues to lag badly in the production of advanced drone technology, although it's likely to catch up somewhat over the next decade. Finally, the Aerospace Defense Forces, also known as the VKO, is an independent arm of the military. It was formed in 2011 by the merger of the Space Command and the Air and Missile Defense Forces. Funding for the VKO has received especially high priority uh, because of its anti-access role in defending Russia against mass precision strikes, especially from the U.S. The backbone of its air defense system consists of 100 batteries of its old uh, S-300 air defense systems, which are still quite capable. But to improve this, it's uh, purchasing several advanced new platforms, such as the S-400. While these are quite formidable, the only real question is whether can, Russia can purchase them in sufficient numbers to make a meaningful difference. In fact, producing modern weapons in sufficient numbers is one of the two key challenges for military reform. The Russian defense industry continues to face many serious problems, including aging factories, technological backwardness, and widespread corruption. Uh, to, Russia continues to be reluctant to suffer the political consequences of implementing real structural reform, and so it continues to sustain many poorly performing companies, forcing the military to continue to accept subpar equipment in many cases. If this is not rectified, Russia could spend billions of dollars in additional procurement, procurement while getting very little return for its investment. The second major problem for Russia's reform program is its continuing manpower shortages. Officially, the Russian military is supposed to have one million active duty troops, but due to unfavorable demographics, Russia continues to struggle to recruit enough volunteers and draft enough conscripts. And the conscripts it receives only serve for one-year terms. As a result, the actual size of the Russian military is probably closer to 700 and 800,000, and it may decline further from this level. Consequently, many units re still remain understaffed, and uh, uh, while high turnover of conscripts adversely affects combat readiness. So the key takeaways for you are that, in my view, despite such deficiencies, so long as Russia stays the course and continues to strive for improvement, the Russian military will continue to make steady progress in improving its overall conventional military capability. To improve beyond this, Russia will have to find solutions to its two key challenges, its deficient defense industry and its ongoing manpower shortages. Since for political reasons this seems unlikely, uh, the reforms will likely fall substantially short of Russia's ambitions for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Clark Murdoch, who is a senior advisor at CSIS and director of the Defense and National Security Group and the Project on Nuclear Issues. Dr. Murdoch is an expert on defense planning, the nuclear mission, and strategy with decades of executive branch, congressional, academic, and think tank experience. His recent work has concentrated on understanding the military force structure implications for the United States of continued sequester level cuts through his uh, affordable military working group, which I believe is launching a report later this week. Uh, and Dr. Murdoch is also currently leading a multiple think tank competitive strategies exercise to think about U.S. nuclear strategy and posture in the 2025 to 2050 timeframe. And in this context, he's been thinking a lot about the evolving Russian nuclear doctrine and strategy and what it means for the United States. He's also spent the last year thinking deeply about strategic stability with China and Russia. And it's this topic with Russia that we've asked him to dig into, us, into for us today. Thanks, Clark. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you for the kind words. I also appreciate your pulling together the panel. I'm not sure which think tank you work at, but I find I'm too busy to actually talk much to my colleagues. So it's always a treat uh, to come here, particularly when they reside on a different floor than I do. Um, so it's always a treat to be on a panel like this and, and to listen to people talk about subjects that they know deeply. Um, I'd like to start out on a definitional thing. When I think about strategic stability, it's a word that was used uh, very frequently in the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review of the United States, but it was never defined. Um, 
the Russians also focus a lot on strategic stability, but unlike the United States, they actually define it. Uh, and what they mean by it really, and I look at it sort of as the absence of instability, they mean it the absence of crisis instability. That is, both sides have nuclear capabilities um, that are formidable enough and robust enough and survivable enough that no one has an incentive to strike first in the case of a crisis. Um, everybody has a first strike capability. The issue is, can you destroy enough on the first strike to limit the amount of damage that you will suffer in retaliation during that time? Uh, the Russians, therefore, worry very much, and so did the Chinese, about uh, ballistic missile defenses on the part of the United States, because while we may not model it, they certainly do model it, what would be the effects of a surprise, bolt out of the blue attack from United States forces against China or Russia, and then what would our defenses be able to sweep up of the remaining offensive capability of both Russia and China? Uh, we in the United States don't tend to think that way. It's like nuclear war is more unthinkable for us. And so we worry about the impact of cyber, the impact of space, but I think what we tend to worry about is the potential for miscalculation and inadvertent escalation. Uh, and that is that we believe, I think many American experts believe that um, the Russians and the Chinese for that matter are sort of overstating their ability to control escalation and may think that they can do something regionally and prevail at the regional level without it mushrooming up, to use a phrase, uh, to the strategic level or nuclear level. Um, and that is of a concern, particularly when you look at the Russian strategy now, where beginning in 2000, shortly after, uh, uh, shortly after Kosovo, which had a real impact, as Andy pointed out, on the way the Russians think about it, immediately after the end of the Cold War, no first use as a, as a declaratory policy went out the window. But after two 1999, when Vladimir uh, Putin was the state secretary for their Security Council, they developed a new military doctrine in which they talk about nuclear de-escalation. That is, the use of a nuclear weapon against a conventionally su superior power that might be invading them, uh, that would be invading them, that would persuade that power to back off and therefore de-escalate the conflict. So it's talking about the first use of a nuclear weapon to de-escalate a conventional conflict, uh, a policy not unlike what the United States did during the 1950s when we had conventional inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the Warsaw Pact, and we deployed, ultimately during the Cold War, 7,000 forward-deployed nuclear weapons uh, that were arrayed around, perhaps not right on the border, but pretty close, so uh, to the Warsaw Pact powers during that time. Uh, so, concern about uh, this instability in the use of nuclear weapons uh, to prevent first strike uh, incentives during that time. Another use of, arm, of, of strategic stability is the absence of an arms race. That is the offense-defense competition that people are, talking, are looking at now. We have one at the conventional level where it's U.S. power projection capabilities versus anti-access aerial denial capabilities uh, of our potential adversaries. Um, same thing occurs at the strategic, at the nuclear level as well. Um, I tend to add another element to this uh, of the absence of, for strategic stability, um, volatility. That is, big perturbations in the relations between uh, United States and Russia or the United States and China, where you have big swings in what's happening, can create an instability all of its own that may lead to the inadvertent escalation that we're talking about. I would argue that Putin's seizure of Crimea was one of those. That is perhaps a game changer in the way we think about our uh, relations with China during this time. Uh, I wanted to draw people's attention to a recent uh, analysis that was done by Dean Wilkening of RAND, and it was done in a tribute to Ted Warner called Challenges in U.S. National Security Policy, in which Dean goes through and does a classic Cold War era analysis of offense and defense exchange rates at the nuclear level. 
and he points out, okay, what is the impact of a first strike from the United States against Russian capabilities? And a bolt out of the blue, full bore, Russians have left 170 weapons. If the Russians do the same thing against the United States, the United States has about 550 weapons that survive. If you factor in a deployment more robust than we have now and assume that it works the way Americans would like it to work, missile defenses, that 170 nuclear weapons that Russia would have after a bolt out of the blue first strike attack goes down to 90. I don't know. Is 90 a comfortable figure for the Russians? Probably not if the United States has five to six times as many weapons at the same point there. So this issue of the perceptions, the Russians still believe the nuclear balance matters in a way that we Americans do not. They do these calculations. Um, so while I think the chances of the Russians developing uh, a sufficient first strike capability in the United States that we wouldn't have enough weapons left uh, to destroy them uh, is well out of reach, largely because they don't have the resources for it. Why are they so much more vulnerable than we are? They're more vulnerable because they don't put as many missiles at sea, because subs are expensive. They don't put as many of their mobile missiles out and have them operate in the field. They could easily increase uh, the amount of survivable weapons they have if they just deployed more on a day-to-day -day alert status, the way we Americans do. Um, another way they can compensate for this is launch under attack, something that the Russians have always been interested in. And that is, when you first see those signals, everything goes out. And if you do that, that raises for the Russians from 170 to 675 warheads deliverable against the United States. That's an enormous increase in their capability in the event of a nuclear exchange. Uh, I'd be very surprised if they didn't have that as part of their operational doctrine during that time because that is you know, a cheap way of compensating for the relative vulnerability of their forces compared to the United States. But it's also one that has a lot of escalatory potential during that time, as we know from a couple of close uh, close brushes that we had during the Cold War. So the Russians still think this way. Uh, they still calculate this way. And it's something I think that we have to keep in mind as we think about what do we do? What does the United States do? And I'll just comment on what does this mean for the United States post-Ukraine? Well, I think the first thing we have to accept is that the era of the United States and Russia moving to become strategic partners of Russia becoming a responsible stakeholder, to use another term, um, that era is over. I think you have to accept that U.S.-Russian relations are going to have a very strong adversarial component to them. And we better just get used to that. That's the reality that we have to live with. Uh, I would also argue that this is a time where the United States having a strategic capability, nuclear capability, uh, second to none, which is the phrase that's used, it's absolutely critical. Um, uh, we may not care as much about the, the nuclear balance uh, because we have conventional superiority, but the Russians care about it a lot. And I'm, I would not want to have to deal with a Russia that felt in some way emboldened by the fact that it believed it had superior nuclear capabilities to the United States. The Russians tend to be pretty crude about these kind of things. The most recent statement I saw was uh, Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin. He's returning from Transnistria, and he's having some problems getting clearances out of Moldova. Moldova, I'm sorry. And he says, well, next time I come back, I'm going to come back in a plane that has nuclear weapons on it, he says. Uh, Russian version of a charm offensive. Um, so important to be second to none. I do not want the Russians to feel that they have, have superior nuclear capabilities, because it'll affect the way they act, because they believe in this stuff. I'd also argue it's not a time for the United States to make any unilateral US nuclear reductions during this time. 
could we afford to have less than 675 survivable, even under the worst of scenarios, nuclear weapons? Probably. But again, the nuclear equation matters a great deal to the Russians. And we shouldn't give the Russians anything without them making a price for it, without them paying a price for it. And I also think another thing we have to do, although this wanders more into the themes that we struck uh, in the last panel, is we have to think about rebuilding U.S. credibility on use of force issues one step at a time. You don't do it all at once, but you do it one step at a time, and that is the Russians, it's important for our security, it's important for Americans, it's important for Europeans, that the Russians believe us when we say we're gonna do something. It's important. And you do that not through what you say, you do it through your actions. And we have a tendency to say a lot of things and not follow up with actions. Witness the imposition of sanctions against Putin for his behavior in the Ukraine. Over to you, Jeffrey. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clark. And let me introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Mankoff, who's the Deputy Director and Fellow with the CSIS Russia and Eurasia Program. He's widely published author and frequent commentator on international security, Russian foreign policy, regional security in the Caucasus and Central Asia, ethnic conflict, and energy security. And in fact, in any given week, Jeff might write on all of those subjects. So hard to keep up with his, uh, with his great writing. Uh, he's a particularly shrewd observer of Russian foreign policy and its surrounding region, and I commend to all of you another piece, uh, which is one he wrote in April, available on our CSIS website, Russia's Latest Land Grab, How Putin Won Crimea and Lost Ukraine. Jeff will uh, fit in uh, a little bit, uh, fill in a little bit more about what Russia is really up to when it comes to its neighbors and how this figures into U.S.-Russia dynamics. Over to you, Jeff. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I should add that um, I see my role here as sort of providing the neighboring perspective on Russian security actions, especially since the crisis in Crimea. Um, Andy and I have been engaged in a project looking at the smaller post-Soviet countries and how they view their changing strategic environment. This is a project that we conceived of more than a year ago um, and have been laying the groundwork for traveling around um, in the Caucasus and Central Asia. Um, this was independent of what happened in Crimea, but obviously what's happened in Crimea uh, has given this a certain uh, relevance perhaps that maybe it didn't necessarily seem to have uh, when we started a year and a half or, or two years ago. Um, we were in Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan uh, in April. We were in uh, the three South Caucasus countries, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, a couple of weeks ago. And on Friday, we're leaving for uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so it's been a really interesting time to um, be in these countries because they are also trying to make sense of what is going on and how Russia's own strategy for dealing with them uh, has changed and the extent to which Crimea does or does not represent some kind of a, a game changer for them. So Andy mentioned one of the things that seems to have changed in Russian foreign policy strategy in the last year or so has been on the question of intervention uh, versus sovereignty. Um, now, th there's always been a certain sense in which the countries of the former Soviet Union occupy a special place in Russian foreign policy, especially with regard to this issue of sovereignty and intervention. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a term that was officially used, and today it, it doesn't have official uh, use anymore, but you still see it in the media and, and it's used by commentators referring to this area as the so-called near abroad. Uh, those are the, the post-Soviet states. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, above all, I think it means that uh, Russia views them as being less sovereign, uh, less independent, and less um, able to uh, guarantee themselves against foreign intervention, specifically Russian intervention. Um, and the connection that this view has to Russian and Soviet history is, is something that you know, we can talk about in the discussion, but needless to say, it very much exists. 
If you go back to the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's been uh, a number of cases of Russian military intervention, both direct and indirect, in the countries of the near abroad, starting with the separatist conflicts uh, in Georgia in uh, the 1990s, in, in the early 1990s. Um, and you know, you've seen these all around uh, the post-Soviet space, and in some, case, in some sense, um, Crimea is just the latest iteration. Um, and yet, traveling around in these countries over the last couple of months, there's a profound sense of unease because there seems to be a real sense that the elites in these countries view what happened in Crimea as a departure from what they viewed as the well-established norms of Russian behavior uh, within the post-Soviet space for two reasons. One, because there was not any clear red line uh, that was crossed in Ukraine that would seem to have given impetus for Russian intervention and uh, detachment of Crimea. Uh, it wasn't as if the new Ukrainian government had made joining NATO uh, a priority. And second, because of the territorial revision. In all of the previous uh, cases of Russian intervention in the post-Soviet space and the near abroad, um, there were political changes in Georgia in 2008. Of course, Russia recognized the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, but Crimea was actually annexed. This was the first time that Russia had gone so far as to actually annex territory uh, from the countries that it had, in which it had intervened. And this was seen in um, the places that we visited as being uh, a clear departure from what Russia had done in the past. So there's really a sense in which we're in kind of uncharted territories here. Um, another way, and I would really call attention to this, you can see in the speech that Putin gave to the Federation Council announcing the annexation of Crimea on March 18th, where he talked about the justification for Russia's uh, new intervention strategy. He talked about a duty to protect Russians and Russian speakers. Um, now, who are these people? Uh, well, ethnic Russians, of course, inhabit much of the much of, um, are scattered around, I should say, much of the former Soviet space. Um, they're concentrated certainly in some areas more than others. Um, in the aftermath of this speech, some Russian politicians began talking about northern Kazakhstan, which has a, a very large Russian population, as being an area that potentially Russia could uh, seek to protect. Uh, Russian speakers, though, is a much broader category that encompasses about 80% of the population of Ukraine, uh, a significant percentage of um, at least the older generation all around the post-Soviet space. And then this was really the first time that Moscow, Putin, the Russian government, had made it a declaratory emphasis that they were going to protect ethnic Russians and Russian speakers. So it's not just now about, um, you know, strategic advantage, it's not just about the relationship with the United States and NATO, but it's also about um, ethnicity in some sense triumphing over sovereignty in the post-Soviet space. And this, of course, calls into question the whole notion of Westphalian sovereignty. If countries are not sovereign over their borders, but rather there's a special right to protect co-ethnics uh, living on the other side of them, then we live in a very different world. Um, and there's one other issue here, too. This wasn't used in Putin's speech on March 18th, but was used in some of the discussion, including from Putin, in the run-up to the annexation, and that was the use of the term compatriots, uh, in Russian. Now, this is a very fluid term, but there's actually a law in Russia that was passed in 2011 that defines who exactly is a compatriot. Um, now, it's anybody who has lived in the Russian Federation or in the Soviet Union, um, and has made a conscious choice, and this is, I'm quoting, has, quote, made a conscious choice in favor of spiritual, cultural, or jurisdictional bonds with the Russian Federation or their descendants. Uh, so this law, coupled with the declaration about protecting Russians and Russian speakers, theoretically gives Moscow very wide scope to exercise a protectorate over people uh, inhabiting various parts of the post-Soviet space. So it's not only ethnic Russians. Ethnic Russians are the people who've gotten the most emphasis, certainly because they're a majority in Crimea. Um, but in terms of Russia's security relationship with the post-Soviet countries, it's, it's much broader than that. Now, the way that Russia has exercised its um, security role in these countries, and certainly this has uh, become especially evident in Crimea, has been the manipulation of ethnicity. Uh, and the, the, the declaration of a protectorate over allegedly threatened ethnic groups. Uh, 
The ability to do this grows out of the Soviet system of ethno-territorial federalism, where the Soviet Union was a kind of pyramid uh, of different ethnic groups inhabiting different territories. And each, as you go down each level, um, there are different territorially concentrated minority groups. It's actually more like a set of concentric circles. Um, and in the context of the crisis in Ukraine, of course, Russia talked about protecting the ethnic Russians living in Crimea, the Russian inhabitants of Ukraine. But, of course, this is a crisis that's not only about Ukraine. Um, the crisis was touched off by Ukraine's aspirations to sign an association agreement with the European Union. But, of course, Ukraine wasn't the only country that was doing that. Georgia, Moldova also are far along in this process. And we see something similar going on in terms of Russian intervention on behalf of allegedly threatened minority groups in both of these countries as well. Um, in addition to the Ossetians and the Abkhaz in Georgia, whom Russia doesn't recognize as actually being in Georgia anymore, um, there has been some effort to um, support ethnic Armenians uh, who are advocating for a uh, closer relationship with Russia, uh, in addition to support for um, strands within the Georgian Orthodox Church, incidentally, um, which is trying to, to slow down the process of Georgia's uh, move towards an integration in the West. In Moldova, uh, efforts to support the aspirations of the ethnic Turkic Gogaz uh, minority, who once again play this role of a kind of, um, um, I don't want to use the word fifth column, but a kind of uh, lever for the introduction of Russian influence, in addition, of course, to the conflict uh, in Transnistria. Now, why does Russia pursue this strategy of promoting ethnic uh, fracturing in countries that seem to be uh, on a path out of Russia's orbit? Uh, well, for one thing, it helps keep them out of NATO, um, because, of course, NATO uh, is not in the practice of admitting countries that have unresolved territorial disputes. Though one of our interlocutors uh, in Central Asia did point out that this issue was finessed uh, when West Germany was brought into NATO uh, and the Article 5 guarantee um, that NATO membership confers was specifically held to exclude uh, East Germany, which of course was outside uh, the bloc. Secondly, Russia pursues this strategy because it provides a foundation for the physical deployment of Russian forces in the post-Soviet space. Uh, so Russian troops were pulled out of Georgia in 2007 at the insistence of the Saakashvili government. Then after the war in 2008 and the recognition of South Ossetian and Abkhazian independence, they were reintroduced in South Ossetia and Abkhazia over the objection of the government in Tbilisi. Uh, similarly, in Transnistria, where the government in Moldova has asked for the withdrawal of these troops, uh, and Russia has said no. Um, third, um, support for separatists can be calibrated uh, in response to political developments. And we see this in eastern Ukraine, where Russia has increased or decreased its uh, security assistance for the separatist rebels in Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, enough to ensure that they're not Mil militarily defeated, but also as a way of keeping um, the threshold of the conflict at a manageable level. And I would argue that this uh, kind of support is something that we have to think about as potentially having applicability not only in countries like Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, but also um, more broadly, because after all, there are ethnic Russians and there are groups that Russia can uh, provide various kinds of political and even uh, security support to in a, a number of other countries as well. Um, we see this in the Baltic states where there are pro-Russian NGOs, um, receiving in some cases Russian funding. Um, we see this in Europe, where if you look at the results of the recent European parliamentary elections in a number of countries, anti-EU parties uh, that did very well did so on the basis of Russian uh, financial assistance. Now, for NATO, for the United States, this is obviously a concern. Uh, NATO, of course, was built to deal with conventional and nuclear military threats. That is the kind of security challenges that we've gotten used to talking about over the last five or six decades. But what we've seen in Crimea and what we're seeing on a smaller scale in some of these other places is uh, the use of Russian security assistance at a lower threshold that may or may not necessarily rise to the level of something that would invoke an Article 5 guarantee. So if Russia provides financial support for uh, pro-Russian parties in the Baltic states or uh, for pro-Russian separatist groups, whether in the Baltic states uh, or elsewhere, how does the United States, how does NATO 
cope with that kind of a, of a challenge, one that doesn't have a clear-cut military dimension to it. Um, and then I would just like to add a couple of, of quick observations from uh, our, our time in Central Asia and the Caucasus that I think help provide a little bit of um, perspective on how not only Crimea, but also the broader changes in Russian uh, security strategy towards this region uh, is viewed um, in, in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Um, one theme that was raised again and again was surprise. Uh, surprised that Russia would go as far as it did, especially given the lack of a clear-cut provocation, such as a decision uh, to pursue NATO membership. One of our interlocutors in Kazakhstan uh, put it very bluntly and said, Crimea was our 9-11. Uh, so it's obviously an event that's causing a lot of rethinking uh, around the region, not only about Russia, but also about where these countries fit and their relationships uh, with the outside world. And of course, that becomes more relevant because the Western response to events in Crimea was almost across the board seen as being fairly weak. Uh, we got, in a number of conversations, complaints that uh, these countries had taken risks, done things that were politically unpopular to support the United States, whether that was sending forces to Afghanistan and Iraq, whether that was uh, signing energy contracts that were beneficial to U.S. allies, uh, and that in response, the U.S. was not doing enough to protect them, either militarily or politically diplomatically. Um, the fact of the matter is Russia is still seeking to court so-called wayward states like Azerbaijan and Georgia, even as it also maintains political relationships with separatist forces uh, in these countries. And the ability of Russia's effort to court these states, I would argue, it will have a lot to do with how they perceive the level of U.S. interest and commitment to them. Um, many would like to see a deeper security relationship with the United States, um, including weapon sales, including um, temporary uh, rotations of, of forces, including uh, training. Um, even countries that have very difficult relations among themselves, like Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, both would seem to have uh, an interest in a higher level of U.S. military support for the other, as long as it doesn't disrupt the balance. Uh, so increases on both sides to maintain parity among them, but at the same time showing a greater level of U.S. commitment to the region as a whole. Um, and so I think the issue for a lot of these countries is that they see that they've entered a new world with Russia, and they're looking very much to the United States and NATO, but the United States in particular, uh, for some kind of leadership to reassure them that this new world isn't one that is going to fundamentally uh, threaten their sovereignty and independence. Thank you. Fantastic. And given who's in the audience today, I would be foolish to ask my own questions and not just turn it over to you. I would ask if you would please, uh, in, in asking your question, please do make it a, a question. Identify yourself and your affiliation. And if you don't mind standing up to, uh, that was a request from external relations today. And just uh, stay, stay put until the mic comes to you. Yeah, and, and Andy suggests rightly that I will collect a, a few at a time. So let me let me take two to start with, right here in the front. Hello, my name is Sahan. I'm interning this summer here in Washington D.C. at a private uh, private equity venture capital startup fund, and I'm originally from the University of Iowa. So my question is: certainly, we've been talking a lot about like uh, you know Russian military technology and ground forces, but uh, there's certainly other ways that Russia can infiltrate, you know, the West and the United States. You know, we've heard they've been involved in cyber, cybersecurity hacking and many other uh, other forms of attacking the United States. My question is, could they attack us financially? Like, for an example, uh, big uh, big state-run companies like Gazprom have been, uh, especially with their recent deal with China, natural gas deal. They have been uh, they have ditched the dollar and using yuan ruble for trade, and also Gazprom also announced that um, they uh, issued their first yuan uh, corporate bond. So my question is, can they, were they able to attack the United States economy by um, uh, valuing their oil prices outside the United States dollar, or using their, tr their currency for international trade instead of the dollar, and by, by, by doing that, is there a possibility that they could attack the United States or the West economically? Thank you, Ambassador Courtney. Uh, yes, hi, Bill Courtney, a retired diplomat. Uh, earlier, former Finance Minister Alexei Kudrin uh, 
caution that uh, the spending uh, for military uh, purposes that President Putin was undertaking could be very costly to the economy. Uh, since then, we now see that there are likely to be setbacks in the Russian economy because of the Ukrainian actions. Uh, is there a possibility that the uh, planned military spending effort might be affected by these uh, economic issues? Great. Why don't we take those? And uh, Andy, you want to take a shot at the first question on uh, Russian financial levers? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, tr I'll address uh, Bill's question as well, briefly. Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, we know that uh, in 2008-2009, uh, um, Vladimir Putin suggested to the Chinese leadership that they engage in a large sale of U.S. T-bills uh, to hurt the U.S. economy, hurt the status of the dollar. Uh, now that's, uh, the Chinese resisted. The Chinese have a much more of a symbiotic economic relationship with the United States, and that was not deemed attractive, attractive to them. Um, but I think this question is much more relevant now that we've embarked on this path of uh, financial, financial si sanctions. And uh, I think that we need to keep in mind that from the standpoint of Moscow, financial sanctions on the, our part essentially constitute an act of war. And that uh, we should certainly be absolutely prepared as well as we can be uh, for every kind of symmetrical or asymmetrical uh, retaliation on the part of Russia in this event. And I am certain that this is one of the inhibiting factors uh, for uh, the Obama administration, not to speak of our European allies, in pursuing uh, this, this course of action. One thing I've been concerned about I mean, we had a very interesting discussion about this back in the middle of May here, in which two U.S. government officials basically said off the record that there is no expert in the U.S. government for what we are trying to do, i.e., to financially isolate a country the size of the Russian Federation. There's no playbook for that. <coughs> the biggest concern for me about is a, is a larger strategic point essentially the capacity to uh, inflict financial sanctions and for them to be effective is based upon essentially continued United States <coughs> hegemony, dominance of the international financial system. The more that we try to use this tool, the more that not only Russia, but everybody is going to look to measures to uh, decrease one, fundamentally, the U.S. role in the international financial system. They're going to look for ways around it. We already saw a lot of evidence of that beginning with these, with these sanctions. And um, uh, so I think we need to think very strategically about, you know, what an asset it is for United <coughs> States power in the world, its role in the financial system, and that we would want to be very, very, very careful about doing things that are likely to lead to the acceleration of the erosion of our domination of the uh, financial, financial system. Um, Bill, on your question about the, uh, the economy, um, it's, an excellent, it's an excellent question. Uh, for me, you know, ever since Mr. Putin came back to de jure power <laughs> two years ago, he, while initially enunciating a set of economic goals and reforms that were very admirable, there's been close to no progress on that reform program. So my larger concern is that he has, to some extent, abandoned or decided to avoid the risk of undertaking structural economic reforms that would be the basis for um, broader and more sustainable economic growth because of the concern that this would risk the political foundation of the system. Um, and if already, since he's become president, the Russian economy has, uh, since its recovery from the global financial crisis, um, 
Uh, it was at about 3 4 percent growth when he came to power, and right now Russian growth is at about zero. And that Russian growth was at about zero basically before financial sanctions uh, hit. I think, I mean, to what extent has the, have the sanctions hurt the Russian economy? Uh, one, they've made the cost of capital already more expensive because of ratings agencies uh, lowering their, uh, their ratings on Russia, so the cost of capital is more expensive. And two, is just increased the perception of risk in the country so that not only foreign investors but also Russian investors themselves uh, are, will want to keep their money, will not want to invest their money in Russia. And that's a problem. An upside with what's happened is, I suppose, from Mr. Putin's standpoint, is that a lot of Russian capital has returned back to Russia over the last few months, um, but I'm not sure that much of it is actually being used. It was very striking uh, to see, you know, in all the hullabaloo last month about the China-Russia um, gas deal, of which we know virtually no details about, <laughs> that uh, uh, Mr. Putin spoke favorably a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago perhaps, about the Russian government uh, capitalizing Gazprom to the tune of 50 to 55 billion dollars uh, for um, for execution of the projects tied to the pipeline and supply of the gas and the development of those gas, those gas resources. Before that deal, there was lots of talk that the Chinese would be putting money on the table. We'll have to, have to see how that uh, turns out. But the, it, it's, it's hard to say, you know, to what extent, uh, I mean, these concerns about Further sanctions are driving Putin. I mean, certainly they're having some effect because Putin tries to play this game to stay below the radar of the multi-sectoral sanctions. Um, but we show very, very little enthusiasm, uh, which I don't necessarily think is such a bad thing, except for the fact that we announced that this, this was our policy, and so it creates the credibility problem. But I think the, the sanctions policy is, in and of its own, is is, uh, is dangerous. But he seems to want to stay below that. Uh, uh, that radar. And any comment on the uh, the actual military spending? Is that is that too, is it too high? Is it needed to sustain the companies? Paul, did you have any thoughts? And specifically on the export piece, maybe we could add that in as well. Let me uh, just comment on the military spending. There already is some impact announced on the uh, the rate of military spending over the next period. Uh, it isn't a, a big deal yet. It's, it sounds like they have agreed to. Minister of Finance and Ministry of Defense to move about 20 to 30 billion dollars to the right uh, while as a result of the economic slowdown. The Russians typically uh, enter into these revolving 10-year procurement programs uh, and they're, they're currently in, in the midst of the 2010 to 2020 procurement plan. They're about ready to roll out a new plan from 2015 to 25, which is typically what they do. They shift the new plan in midstream, which is a great way to avoid accountability, by the way. But um, I've, I believe, I've always believed that their ambitions to rearm by 2020 were unrealistic. And I think most observers would also concur with that. So I think more realistically it would be the 2025 to 2030 time frame. Bill, just one last point on that, because I, I if you, before February 28th, I would have said Mr. Putin faces a real problem. The pie is not growing. He's overpromised uh, spending, whether it's military or whether it's social welfare spending for, for citizens. And uh, I would have been more confident that he would have sacrificed more on the military spending to make sure the social welfare spending continues and subs subsidies and salaries getting paid and pensions getting paid. Because people that depend upon the state as a source of their income, that's his core constituency. I'm not sure how, how, how hard that, how hard that holds uh, at this point, but he does have to win an election in 2018. Great. Let me take another couple of questions. Sir. Uh, Peter Humphrey, Intel analyst and former diplomat. If I were Putin, I would cool my jets for a couple of years and then make a big play for Transdenister before Obama leaves office. Uh, this would help uh, lock down, surround the Ukraine. And uh, 
I'm wondering uh, what you guys think about that possibility. Do you, do you concur? And more importantly, what on earth are we doing to prevent that inevitability? And next, next question right, right to your right there. Thank you. Ed Verona with McLarty Associates uh, for Mr. Schwartz. You referred to the Mistral sales. Could you say just a few more words? How significant would the Mistral uh, cra ships be uh, in addressing the capability gaps in the Soviet, uh, excuse me, Russian military? Okay, let's take uh, just one more question. Way, way in the back there. Uh, my name is Ken Duckworth. I'm with the U.S. Department of Commerce, most recently, most recently our trade attache in St. Petersburg. It seems also, you know, the U.S. has the issue with sanctions of uh, some of our companies uh, having business interests in Russia, and I think in the oil and gas sector, uh, we have the U.S. Chamber now and, and NAM sort of publicly coming out against sanctions. Um, how does that, it doesn't help the, the administration's position, but how do we counterbalance some of that here when we have to look at the larger strategic picture and not just the bottom line of ExxonMobil or uh, some of the larger players in, in the industry there. Great. Well, let me suggest that we actually start with the Mistral uh, question about how, how major a capability that is. And then um, why don't we go to the end of the table, starting with Jeff, uh, to answer the other two questions on Putin cooling his jets and the larger strategic considerations with, with further sanctions. Thank you. The purchase of the Mistral will fill a gap in Russia's limited force projection capabilities operating its near abroad. It allows them to overcome some of the deficiencies that they encountered during the Georgia War, where they struggled to come up with adequate transport uh, to move forces from uh, Crimea and other parts of the Russian mainland to Georgia. Uh, this ship will have several different capabilities, including uh, assault helicopter transport capability to move uh, forces, uh, su relatively substantial number of forces that are on shipboard to uh, to land in the event of uh, need for uh, some kind of an expeditionary action. It also can act as a command and control center for those forces. It, it can also support um, deployment of uh, ground-based forces through fast attack craft as well. The primary uh, thinking that I've seen in my research on the Russians is that they're looking for this primarily to beef up their capability and they're near abroad. There occasionally you see discussion about potentially using this for a, a longer range out of area operations, if you will. For, for example, there's some discussion about using this to combat Somali pirates uh, that were potentially uh, attacking or taking over Russian merchant vessels near the, uh, the, the coast of Somalia, so, yep. Okay, Jeff. Okay, um, on Transnistria, yeah, you know, during the Crimea crisis, the salience of Transnistria started increasing. Uh, this is a frozen conflict that's been pretty well frozen for the better part of two decades, and as recently as four or five years ago, it looked like there might actually be a political process leading to some kind of, of managed outcome. And that seems to have, have gone away. Uh, and I think the significance is, well, it's a couple of things. I mean, one, because if you look at the map of where Transnistria is located, the only way that Russia can supply it, can move people and equipment and anything else into Transnistria is basically through Ukraine. Um, and so you started hearing this narrative in the Russian press about how uh, there was a, an alleged blockade uh, of Transnistria. And my own reading of that is that it was laying the groundwork to justify a deeper uh, intervention into Ukraine, not only uh, Crimea, not only the, the east, but potentially um, much broader to open up some kind of a, of a corridor to Transnistria. Um, and I think that possibility uh, is one that the Kremlin is still keeping in reserve um, to see, to potentially employ down the road. Uh, now, both of Moldova and Ukraine have now signed their association agreements with the EU. Um, and that was, in part, I think, the eventuality that Russian pressure was designed to um, prevent. So now, 
you know, we'll see what happens. But the presence of, of Transnistria does remain uh, as a kind of sword of Damocles that the Russians can dangle, not only over Moldova, um, but also over Ukraine. Uh, and so I think it's a, it's a space that very much bears uh, watching. Um, especially because if both Ukraine and Moldova are in, um, have the free trade agreements with the EU and are closed off by new customs frontiers from Russia, um, then Transnistria becomes very economically as well as politically isolated, and that is a potentially dangerous uh, scenario. Um, as far as the, the opposition of the U.S. business community to, to sanctions, um, I guess what I would say is that, you know, this is a, it's a difficult place for the administration to be in. Um, on the one hand, I think one way that you gain credibility is to take steps that are going to have a negative impact on your own interests, showing that you're willing to accept a cost, uh, including potentially a cost to your, your business community to do things um, that are in your strategic advantage. But that's very hard to do right now because there's um, so much opposition on the European side. And the argument that the Chamber of Commerce uh, and others are making, and I think it's a valid one, is why should American companies suffer the brunt of sanctions when uh, the European governments are not willing to, to do anything similar, and so the European companies will continue to have opportunities to do business with Russia that are being denied to American companies. Uh, and that, I think, is the, is the challenge that the administration uh, has to face. It, it, it's, it's going to need, um, I think, more buy-in from at least the Germans uh, in order to, you know, to, to maneuver around this this, prob this problem, uh, and I think Merkel has been pretty good on this score, but uh, there's a lot of, of people that she has to keep happy, and of course, you know, she also has to maneuver in the, in the very complex uh, environment of, of intra-EU politics as well. Um, so I don't think there's, there's a simple answer here, unfortunately. Clark, do you want to add anything, especially on the question of whether you, you think uh, Mr. Putin will now take a strategic time out or whether he'll continue to press? Um, purely personal reading on this, I don't think so. Uh, the reason I don't think so is that Putin is a player. He senses an opponent of, uh, to use the Washington Post phrase, one who dithers, indecisive. You don't give a weak adversary time to recoup. You keep pushing. And so my reading of Putin is that he will keep pushing. And that's where the risk of, of miscalculation comes in, because I think there will become a point at which the action that the United States takes will be one that raises the stakes considerably for Russia in this context, and so is worrisome. We've got exactly two minutes left, so Andy, why don't I turn over the remainder of the time to you, and we'll close out on this question. <laughs> I was going to talk for 30 seconds. Just to the, to the Transnistria question. I think from the, from the standpoint of using this as an action to support uh, his domestic political consolidation and going into the 2018 election, which I think is a significant consideration since I do not see anything probably happening positive with the Russian economy, even with the economic sanctions out the window, then it would make sense to have this maybe a bit down the road because you do need to kind of swallow Crimea uh, and that's going to be more complicated than people think because you're going to have to deal directly with the Kievan government about supplies of water, there's the, elect, uh, the power generation grid, et cetera. And then, of course, you know, they've got the, what right now is the $8 billion uh, uh, cost estimate for the, uh, the bridge uh, from Kerch uh, to Crimea, which would make the supply to Crimea much, much better. But on the other hand, exactly as Clark stated, uh, you know, if, if the United States, and this will segue to my last, my last comment, if the United States and its allies were actually to do some effective things to strengthen the, the sovereignty, uh, i.e. the capacity for countries like Moldova and others to raise the costs of Russian military intervention and take that action in a pretty strategic and compre comprehensive way, then the incentive for Mr. Putin is, would be to take action sooner rather than later before uh, uh, 
that, uh, that comes about. Now, in the, and this gets to the, the, the sanctions point. My position on February 28th has been consistent on this, that we need to spend a lot less time on punishing Russia, because nobody can punish, punish Russians better than Russians themselves. Mr. Putin is punishing Russia very effectively ec economically. The, the, the fairly weak sanctions that we've put on actually just give him a good excuse to, to, to push the blame over to us, the West, for Russia's economic, economic woes. Now, I'm not categorically against sanctions, but I think that far more time and strategic thought and resources needs to be put to strengthening the capacity of states like Ukraine, like Moldova, like Georgia, like Armenia, like Kazakhstan, whoever desires stronger support, economically, militarily, security, and otherwise. That is, to me, where the, the strategy should be. And then we can talk less about, less about sanctions, and we can talk more about what we actually do to strengthen the sovereignty of those countries, and that addresses the crux of the strategic problem. Excellent note to end on, and thank all of you for coming out on an, early on a Monday and a July 4th weekend, and thanks to the panel.